on to week four and on to effects processing. You've already done a decent amount of processing to your sounds already. When we had the week on sampling, you went in and you actually, you know, chopped it up, repitched it, maybe changed the volume, threw pan around a little bit, and that is affecting the sound. So that really does count as effects processing. In the week on synthesis, if you're starting with something like a subtractive synth and in its most initialized state, that instrument is usually just a sine wave or a saw wave. But once you start to add additional oscillators, you start to detune them a little bit, you add in a filter, you add in envelopes, maybe the instrument has a chorus effect. If you spent some extra time with the synth one, you had a lot of different effects on there. And that also counts as effects processing because you are changing that sound. But this week, we're actually stepping back away from the sample itself or away from the instrument and doing some additional moves to change and shape our sounds. So instead of like going into the sample itself and changing the volume within the clip, we would go to more of a macro level and actually change the fader and change the pan pot position. All of that stuff is going to count as effects processing. And in this lesson, we're going to do what we've done in some of the other introductory lessons to the week and kind of talk not really about the history, but just what's come before and how it's then been emulated and modeled in the computer and why it's important for us to understand that. I'm sure by now you all are really tired of looking at this slide, but it's actually really important to the entire course and especially if you're new to making music. So the way I look at it, when you're making music or you're doing something creative in general, you always want to have a plan of attack. Even if that plan is something like complete randomness, then that's what your plan is. You never want to approach something completely blank minded and just kind of throw things at the wall and hope that it sticks. And I know when I first started to make music, that was exactly what I would do. I would load up a sample or load up a drum machine and just kind of willy nilly throw things at it and be like, all right, I guess that works. Who knows? Or just randomly picking a preset and saying, all right, I guess I'm going to go with that. There's nothing wrong with using presets as long as that preset accomplishes what it is you're actually going for. This is what makes the music making process something that's very human as opposed to completely automated. You still have to think and decide how do I want to affect and process this sound. Yes, everything is all digital and it's all being done by a computer and you can use presets to accomplish that, but somewhere you still have to make the decision. And when you get started, it's not that easy because you don't know what any of the effects or tools are doing. So how could you possibly anticipate what it is that you need to put on to get a sound where you want it to be. And that's really the point of this course in breaking all of this stuff down. It's so that in the future, later on, when you're making music, when you're making the music that you want to make, it becomes almost instinctual. It's second nature in your head. You're listening to a sound and you know, ah, yes, I need it to have this type of chorus effect, for example. And then you grab that chorus effect and you get the sound that you want. So that's the point of these think first slides. It's that you are deciding in advance what you want to go for. And then with the knowledge you have, you make the best educated guess you possibly can. And sometimes it won't work and you'll have to try a few different things. But you always want to have an initial idea, a plan in mind before you go forward. And don't be discouraged if right now when you're sitting down and making music, you know, you forget all the stuff that I've said. You forget these lessons and you kind of just are throwing things at the wall and hoping something sticks. There's a process. It takes time. You will have to go through that. It might take, you know, two, three, four months, but eventually it starts to become like, okay, this is the sound I want and I'm just going to drop it in. And unfortunately, there's no teaching method. There's nothing I can do to really make that transition any easier or go any quicker, but I think it's important to already start to tell yourself, okay, let's think about what I want first, and then with the knowledge I have, see if I can get there. If you'll remember back to the earlier presentation, I think even the very first presentation where we were talking about the history of audio recording, I tried to make it crystal clear that everything has taken time. It's not as if one day the studio was empty and the next day it was totally full of a bunch of different processors that people could use. That is not the way it worked. People who were in recording studios from the beginning were bringing in different tools one at a time and having the opportunity to really learn it and or they really needed it for something. So for example, if you need a broadcast limiter, you know exactly what it's doing. It's doing something that's fixing a problem that you've had in the past. Today, when you open up the computer, you just have everything there right away. And so for you, it's sort of like, well, when do I need to use this? What's the application for this? 
Is this going to work here? And for people from the past who've gone through each and every stage and have seen all this development, it's again, it's second nature. They know what it's going to do. They know the effect it's going to have. But for you opening up a DAW in 2016, it's just not that simple. And so I like doing these presentations so that you understand that there's been an evolution, that there is a timeline. And with the effects that you have in your computer today, there is almost for every one of those, there's some kind of hardware equivalent. And it might be something that's completely analog, like you know some of the early EQs or mixing consoles that are totally analog, or it could be digital processors. So if you think about something like a lexicon reverb, right? It's using DSP, it's all chips and you know microprocessors whatever but it's still a hardware box it's still a box it's still something where you have to turn knobs and move faders around to get the settings that you want to get only recently have all of these things been converted into complete code and have you been able to make the changes totally in the computer so the second bullet point here is another one that i don't think people really fully understand or they kind of take it for granted very few brand new effects are commercially released today. Uh, and when I say brand new, I mean people are looking at audio and thinking of totally new and unique ways of processing it, meaning that nothing from the past has influenced the effect that they're creating. That is very rare. And if it does exist, it kind of happens more in the academic community and within the world of academia. If they were to release it to the public, it probably wouldn't get used that much because the majority of listeners today might find that processing to be not very musical. All right, that's kind of a fairly common thing. So we've already developed a ton of effects and ways of changing our sounds that we do deem to be musical, that we do like the sound of. And so the reason I bring this bullet point up is once you learn some of these basics, once you learn um, some of the core effects, and we'll talk about categorization in the next lesson, you really should always be good to go in the future every time you bring something in. There are some things that are very uniquely digital, and I don't even think we're really going to get into any of those in this course. But when that happens, okay, it's a new skill set. It's something new that you have to learn. But pretty much eight or nine times out of 10, when you load in an effect after learning the basics, after learning the fundamentals, you will be able to figure out and predict what it's going to do to your sound and probably even have an idea in your head of how it's going to change that sound. So you'll even kind of be able to anticipate what will happen before it happens. To me, the mixing console is really something that all of us, myself included, take totally for granted when we open up the digital audio workstation. It really wasn't that long ago when it was impossible for us to control levels of different input signals of multiple microphones. And I'm sure you guys have actually heard the stories of when they would record old radio dramas and they would only have one microphone. And that microphone is just broadcasting out over the airwaves on the radio. And they would have five or 10 different people all kind of standing around doing different parts, getting up closer to the microphone when you needed it to be loud or moving really far away if you want it to sound like something distant. But we take it for granted today that we can so easily just turn something like a fader to control the volume. And you're thinking, uh, fader, that's not an effect. You know, you're just changing volume. You're making it louder or softer. But that in itself is probably the most powerful effect that you have today. And you can think about it on a really macro level. Like I remember at the Super Bowl one year, you know, you have all these commercials. Everyone's competing for loudness. They want their commercial to be the loudest thing so that people will look up and pay attention to their ad. And then out of the blue, there's a commercial that's total silence. Okay, and it's just nothing. And that is what really drew everyone's attention to the screen because you're thinking, what happened? Did the game turn off? Is there a problem? Is there something wrong? And I think it was like a car commercial or something, but it really had an impact. Okay, so the volume level itself is actually a really powerful effect that we kind of take for granted today, but without it, I don't know, we really wouldn't have music today because the ranges of sounds, fade ins, fade outs, when you mute something, when it goes away, that's really crucial to making music. Because if there's one sense that as human beings, we're really attuned to, it's proximity. We want to know if there's a tiger right behind us ready to come in and pounce. And of course, over time, this is changing. 
because we don't have to worry about those things anymore. But it's still something that's very much a part of our being and our species. And if you're aware of that and you can control those different level faders, you can tap into that a little bit and get people more interested in whatever music it is you're making. Or if you uh, think about classical music, right? How important are all the different dynamic markings? It's not uncommon for a song to go from something uh, very quiet to something very loud, right? All the way up to fortissimo, right? So you can really build it up, build it up, build it up and then you can have very very quiet parts as well all within the same composition and that's designed to just make the listener be more interested to be actively listening hearing those changes understanding other in the soft passages you have to listen a little closer and in the loud things it kind of blows you back in your seat a little bit so never underestimate something as simple as a volume fader that in and of itself is a very powerful effect we also have, of course, pan position, another thing that's commonly found on mixing consoles. So do you want it way off to the left? Do you want it way off to the right? Do you want it somewhere in the middle? Nowadays, we have very advanced panning plugins that can be used. It can kind of go beyond just full left, full right. We'll talk about that a little bit with a plugin that we'll be using. So pan position also very important. Once we had that advent of stereo, we can now position instruments in different locations so you can simulate something like a stage and a bunch of performers. So you can put some guitars hard left. You put that vocalist right down the middle. You know, you put, uh, I don't know, your keyboards far right. You can do so much with pan position. And just these two effects together can really change an entire song. How could we talk about a mixing console and not talk about the EQ? So having the ability to actually change the frequency response of an instrument, to take out low end, to really boost um, regions in the sound, to try to make it sound clearer. Uh, you can sometimes take away harshness or add it in, you know, add in mud, take it away. These are all just descriptive terms um, talking about a frequency response of an instrument. And today, things have kind of changed a little bit because we use a lot of these multi-sampled instruments that are already recorded really well so if we are using eq it's more like trying to fit all of those puzzle pieces together so that you can hear everything or hear particular ranges of that instrument super well because it's going to work well with something else but think about like early days of eq the reason that eq was there was a lot of times to fix fix problems in recordings. So if you had a recording and it was in a bad room and there's like a resonant frequency just like constantly peaking out, you could isolate that frequency and kind of take it away. And so you're removing um, a part of the sound that is unflattering or that's not going to benefit the record as a whole. And really, if I think, if we think about it even today, you have a fader, a pan position, and something like a three band EQ like we're seeing here, you know, infinite number of possibilities already exist for you. And these are just some of like the three most basic effects uh, that you're going to have access to. So never underestimate them, never take them for granted. Inside of the computer, we can actually emulate a similar signal flow to what you just saw going through the mixing console. And we could put it on every single channel like what you see in this screenshot. All right, so on the far left, we have the meter. We can change the volume. We have a pan position. We could also use the actual faders themselves within the program. That's totally fair game. So you can see the pan position and the volumes are all changed a little bit. The thing on the top here actually emulates a preamp. So I didn't mention this before, but if you look at the top of this EQ, you can read it says line and mic. That's setting the level of the preamp, and that actually has its own distortion characteristics and ways of coloring the sound. So this isn't the exact same preamp this is actually more of like a tube preamp that you're looking at or at least a modeling of one but you could drop that on if you wanted to add a little bit of extra girth to the sound and you can see that i've put that in on only one channel here and the other two channels don't have it so it's kind of a choice thing you can choose to use it or not use it and then below that we have a three band eq which we could set into like british mode or into american mode or whatever we wanted to do there to try and emulate a particular sound or particular style of eq and you could put that on every channel and just using you know really these two effects we don't even need that preamplifier stage but even just those two effects just the pan position the volume and this eq we'd be able to do so much even with just a limited number of sounds and that's what's really cool and really amazing about effect processing so let's go beyond the mixing console and talk about some other effects and their development. And we're starting with probably everyone's favorites, right? Reverb and delay. So the way I'm recording right now into this 
um, screen application program that's recording the screen is I have a microphone set up and I'm probably, I don't know, I'm very close to the microphone, just two or three inches away. And the reason I'm that close to the microphone is because I don't want you to actually hear the room. If I had this microphone positioned like six feet away from me, you would definitely hear the characteristics of this room. And it would sound like I was coming from far away and it would be kind of weird to be watching this presentation right now. We've all had that experience of watching a YouTube video or listening to a podcast or something where the person clearly doesn't understand like how to set themselves up for miking. And it sounds like, you know, they're a ghost or they're in a tunnel and maybe it sounds cool for a little while, but eventually it kind of starts to get on your nerves. Well, with music in general, there was this idea that you want to sometimes have that realism of the space. In fact, you want it almost every single time you're making music. So if you want um, a guitar to sound like it's more distant, you would record that guitar far away from the microphone. The issue with that is you're only limited to that room and you're limited to how good of a job you do with the recording. So some clever person way back in the day realized that you could actually like close mic everything. So instead of recording that guitar from across the room, you could actually bring it up close to the microphone. You could record that. So you're trying to eliminate as much room sound as possible, but then you could actually feed that signal that guitar signal, take it from a channel on the mixer and feed it into a loudspeaker in a very large room. And what you're seeing in the upper left here is what's referred to as an echo chamber or a reverb chamber. So they would take that close mic signal and they would feed it through and they would have this room that gave them this really nice reverby type sound. So a room sound, all the echoes, all the reflections, uh, because of course sound is always bouncing all over the place. And what they would do is they would take a microphone or sometimes two microphones microphones if you had the ability to do this in stereo and you would put them like at the back of the room or you could put them anywhere in the room where you felt like the sound was really full really rich and that would be your reverb and so you could bring that back in with the guitar track and thus you have like the send in return sort of structure and you're getting the original sound plus you're trying to isolate just that room sound so it's coming out of the loudspeaker and then you position the microphone like usually as far away from that loudspeaker as possible and sometimes you'd even turn the microphones to the back wall as compared to turning them towards the speaker whatever is going to work best for the sound and thus you had this sort of like real reverb and if you look at a lot of the convolution reverbs today and you can just search that in google you'll see that they've actually modeled some of these rooms and so you can actually kind of get the same thing inside of your computer and it's even actually very easy if you have a, a simple little mixing board set up to like take them take a loudspeaker of some kind put it into like your bathroom and then record that sound so it's really easy to make your own echo chamber or reverb chamber it's just not that practical but you could definitely set it up and at the time when they were doing this, it wasn't all that practical either, but there was just no other option. So it was very ingenious. With delay, um, early history of delay actually used multiple tape machines. So you could have one tape machine play back, and then you could kind of have another tape machine play back slightly later. And so you could create these kind of rudimentary delay effects. Um, we're not going to go into that history too much, but what you're actually looking at here is a tape delay in the upper right. So with this tape delay, you actually would record onto loops of tape and then play those loops back at a certain time. And thus you have this like really early delay and you could turn the feedback. So that's telling you how long that tape is going to keep playing back, AKA how many iterations of delay you're going to get. So some early effects, just really clever with the technology that existed at the time, and thus it could be used. So if you want to have um, a voice and with the last word, right, you want it to kind of echo on and on and on, you would just put that last word onto the tape, play it back over and over again, and uh, there you go. So a very basic delay. And then the bottom, we're looking at one of these Lexicon 224 digital reverbs. So with these guys, um, this is kind of, you know, a little bit later on, but as the computer technology started to improve, we were able to actually then emulate room sounds, room spaces using digital signal processing. And then you would just kind of like feed and patch things up. So you could still send into this machine like you'd send into a room, but instead of having a loudspeaker and microphones, you're really just kind of going into a computer and it's simulating a room. Because if we think about reverb, what it really is, is just a 
bunch of delays, just really fast delays, some longer delays, because it's the sound bouncing off all the walls. And so it's very difficult and processor intensive to um, simulate that. And that's why if you search like Lexicon 224, you'll see these images of that little controller that you see, and then you'll see this gigantic box. And that gigantic box is actually what's doing all of the processing. So it's not as if the entire reverb and all of the... Uh, the uh, DSP components and the computer chips exist inside of that little controller. It's actually in this gigantic box. Okay, so this is just a little bit of history on the evolution of these different effects. But again, back inside the computer, we can do the same thing now very easily using just, you know, two small little GUIs, and they can be just as powerful as some of the effects that we're looking at here. They sound different, of course, but it's the same idea. So we have a reverb on top and a delay on the bottom. Nice and cozy, easy to bring up. We don't have to worry about having that gigantic box or uh, have anything potentially breaking on us like you could easily have break. I mean, just look at the tape loops there at the top. It's not like the most stable thing in the world. I'm sure many of you are familiar with what you're looking at right now, and maybe even a lot of you have some of these. These are, of course, different stomp boxes. And some of these stomp boxes would, again, be digital, they would have computer chips inside of them. Others are very analog and some of them would be like a tube overdrive, for example. So there would actually be a tube inside of this little box and you drive your uh, guitar signal in and then you can choose how hard you want to overdrive that, get the distortion, etc. But again, there's been a lot of development with stomp box technology. And at the time it was mostly used for guitars, right? Like you would change the tone and the shape of the guitar. If you ran something else through it, maybe it would sound good, but that wasn't really the application. But today, again, in the box, we have the ability to, first of all, um, emulate a lot of these stomp boxes, like what you see right in the middle. It looks very similar to the thing that's on the bottom left in the middle. And indeed, that is what it's trying to emulate there. Uh, <laughs> but we also can even take this a step further. And I didn't pull a picture out, but uh, I could have, you know, guitar amplifiers. So what we have there on the left and guitar cabinets. So we can even go as far as to um, just record a guitar in direct, like a DI guitar, and then we could take that and we could actually run it through the computer to give us our tone as compared to having to pay all that money to get an amplifier cabinet set up and have a lot of different stomp boxes. Um, if you have Logic Pro X, for example, with that program, they give you a whole range, like 12 or 15 different stomp boxes that you can actually drop in. And it's a lot of fun to just use those as your effects. Um, if we were all using Logic Pro X, I would definitely have an assignment where the only effects you're allowed to use are the stomp box effects. And what's really cool is that in the computer, these effects can be stereo. Whereas when you look at them here, most of these are mono effects. And in fact, in this picture, I think they might all be mono effects. Some of them, like chorus effects, you can actually go in one side in mono, and then you actually, it comes out in stereo. So uh, very cool, very creative. But in the computer, of course, everything can be stereo. And it can go as far as what you look there on the far right, a multi-effects unit where not only are you able to have a amplifier in a cabinet, but you also then have a reverb and multiple EQs to shape the sound even further, all in one little package, all in one simple plugin. We've already talked a lot about rack effects, but I just thought I'd show it to you one more time. On the right, you have more things like compressors and EQs, but on the left here is actually a great picture to showcase just how much was done digitally, but we're still like rack effects. So if you look at that, there's a lot of different like reverbs, chorus echo effects. Uh, there's the sans amp there, so that's like a distortion. All these different effects had been developed to try and get you those sounds. So you'd have a lot of like digital reverbs and if you actually go online and just search something like 80s reverb rack unit, okay, you'll be able to find a lot of these on like eBay or Craigslist for a hundred bucks or like $200 or sometimes even cheaper than that. But they're really not that different from the reverbs that you're downloading um, today as plugins. They're all digital, but they do still have to have like amplification stages. So you still have to be able to plug in that, you know, quarter inch jack or whatever in and out from the mixing board. And so a lot of people sometimes still like to go to some of these old units. And a lot of these are like really, um, <laughs> I don't know how to explain 
explain this. The quality isn't worse, but it's like this really sort of like they had to get as much into it as they could using what they had. So like a lot of it's like 16 bit, right? It's not like the 24 bit stuff that we see today, but at the same time, it's still all about the sound. So there were a lot and a lot of these multi effects racks and these digital boxes that came out. I'm sure you heard of things like Eventide, right? They made some really popular ones um, that are still used in studios today for the sound quality. And you could use these things and again, shape your sound even further. So we have things like um, these reverb and delay units, right? With like uh, digital processors, you have things like the stomp boxes, and then you even had rack effects as well. And in the computer, we have so much that's emulated the stuff that used to be in racks. So whether it's something like a chorus, like you see in the upper right, something like a reverb, um, compressors, EQs, and then even some more unique kind of effects, uh, we're able to no longer need the rack space. But as you can see, it's like space saving, but Maybe not if you're bringing in like so much stuff that it becomes cluttered and you don't know what to pick from. So advantages of working in the box. And when I say advantages, advantages can just as easily be disadvantages in the wrong hands. Because what's so great about working in the computer or what's so flexible about working in the computer is that you can load up as many plugins as you want. You're not limited by rack space. You're not limited by the number of cables that you can like all put together if you have a bunch of stomp boxes. You're not limited by the number of channels that you have on your mixing console. You can really do whatever you want to do with the sound. And this is one of the reasons why we haven't seen like a lot of development in new effects. Because think about it this way, okay? You have one audio signal, just whatever. Maybe it's your voice or maybe it's a guitar. Let's say it's a guitar. You've recorded a guitar into the digital audio workstation. Now, in the past, you would only be, you'd be limited by what you had, the number of cables, and really your patience, because it's not that easy to take like 10 different stomp boxes and reorder them. Because to do that, you'd have to like change all of the cabling. It would take like 10 or 15 minutes. In the computer, you can load up as many stomp box plugins as you want, and you can change the order lickety split. You can just drag and drop and move things around, and you can experiment for hours and hours, and you have an unlimited number of sonic possibilities that are going to come out of that. If you want to take that guitar sound, you can duplicate the guitar sound. And so you can kind of do like parallel processing. You have an original and then you have one that you've processed in different ways. We're not going to be doing it in this course, but you could even take that guitar sound and you could do something like multi-band processing. So you could take that sound and split it out based on different frequency ranges and put different effects inside each of those bands. So there's just so much in the computer you can do with the audio signal itself that it's really not necessary to have brand new effects coming out every single year because it would be overwhelming, even with just three effects, okay? So let's say that you start with an EQ. With that EQ, you could do a million different things and get a million different tones. And then after that, let's say that you put a reverb. Okay, and with that reverb, there's a lot of settings you could put on, and then you have a filter. But if you wanted to, you could then take those effects and reorder them, and that could then completely change the sound. So some of the things that I just thought off on the top of my head of working in the box as compared to outside of the box, meaning it could still be digital processors, but they're just hardware units. We have the ability to route audio wherever we want it to be. And for that reason, everything becomes very flexible. The effects nowadays, they can run mono, stereo, mono to stereo. You could go stereo to mono if you really wanted to. And that sort of an idea just didn't really exist in the analog domain. You have unlimited slots. You could duplicate the same effect 80 times. No problem. In the real world, you only have as many as you have unless you want to keep resampling again and again. And as I said before, it could be an all-day process to do that as compared to something you can mock up in two or three minutes in the computer. So those are some of the advantages of working in the box. But remember that those advantages can only be as powerful as you allow them to be because they can just as easily become distractions for you if you're not able to put it in perspective and kind of move on. And that's why we really have this uh, think first slide at the beginning because nowadays 
you can think about so many possibilities where before maybe you really only had two or three combinations you could make. Now you have hundreds of combinations that you can make. So you really need to sit down and think about what you're trying to accomplish first. So you don't just end up dragging and dropping at random and never really getting anything accomplished and never getting that sound that you're looking for.